indescribable, indestructible, nothing can stop it. Run, don't walk. This is the Cult Faction Podcast, episode 100, Spotlight on The Blob. One hundred. One hundred. FYI, they don't get music now because it Sorry. fucks the thing up. One hundred. So. Go through outside, you can't hear the music. <laughs> Sounds heavier. Did you redo it? Might be no, I, to be, I'm not entirely sure I can remember how to play it, to be honest. <laughs> Shh. Don't ruin it. Hello, and welcome to episode 100 of the Cult Faction Podcast, where we give all of our... What? I can't hear you. I can hear you. I can hear me. I can't at all. Oh, well, well that's just gone and... So I can now. Carry on. Yeah, so, episode 100. <laughs> episode 100 it starts... <laughs> The same as any other episode, to be fair. Something, <laughs> some technical issue. So I was going to say, not as bad as last week. It I took can't us about half an hour to get yeah. episode one hundred, and it was like over two years ago in lockdown, where we were struggling, all dialing into different Teams calls or Skype oh, yes. calls or whatever it was to start with. You know, technical issues, unpolished performances, and now we're as slick as anything, and we just start now. At one hundred. Are you, we're recording this, if you can see in our outdoor studio. <laughs> yeah, Damien has done uh, uh, a decent OB. We, we will be uh, on the road this summer with our tour truck. <laughs> 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 they call it Cheggers. I'd be up for that. Cheggers tour truck. <laughs> See, yeah, the, the downside of being on these outdoor tables is <laughs> every noise gets picked up by the mic. Yeah, so you might get some dogs barking, birds singing me going oh is that a mosquito or a bee or something but no we are outside we are still battling the elements most of which is summers <laughs> but, but we made it we are here at 100 looks like 100. we made it yeah so we will be giving all of our normal spiel and what we've been up to what we've been watching the bits that damon doesn't like and then we'll be putting our little spotlight the focus lens as it were on a seminal classic from 1958, The Blob. But before yeah. we do that, Damien, what have you been up to, mate? Oh, I've also forgotten to intro. Oh, God. Yeah, right. I am Paul Hawkins. <laughs> I'm Doing... Brett Summers. I'm Damien Hicks. See, that's it. He, he goes it's all gone up, out the window. And he ruins it because he can't hear it. Oh, it's just Brett's fault, is it? Yes. Okay. So, Damien, Fair what have you been up to? What have I been up to? I have been to Peppa Pig World. Did I you have, get an interview? No, she didn't want to speak to me. Bitch. <laughs> yeah, well, she is a bitch, isn't she? She's a spoiled little brat. It could be a bloke in that costume as well, though. Yeah, it could be. What does it mean, costume? It's the real deal. Pepper Pig World. It's Pepper Pig it's World, not like House of Davos. Yeah. It's the real place. I've seen that house now. Like <laughs> that elephant thing from the fire adverts from when we were kids. This is the real deal. Anyway, Wellington. Oh, that's the one. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I've been to Peppa Pig World <laughs> on an extremely hot day where I didn't get to sleep until 3 o'clock that morning and we were at Peppa Pig World by 9.15. Yeah, how was so it? I would you normally really go like on Peppa all the adult, kid, adult rides whilst we're there because it's obviously attached to Poland. And you're paying lots of money. And we're paying lots of money, but I just couldn't be asked. I would just follow the kids around like a zombie. I just pictured you on the waltzes going 100 miles an hour and you were just Yeah, <laughs> that's, it wasn't far from that, to be fair. Um, then on Saturday, I dressed as a shark and chased kids around the garden. That was good fun. For everyone? Yeah. Any particular reason? <laughs> no, I just found like doing it. <laughs> I put a sign out the front, uh, but out at the end of the driveway. Shark attack rides or something. I can't remember what I put down. And <laughs> kids just turned up and I chased them around the garden. Uh, you and your hobbies. Get a little glimpse into Damien's life here. Yeah. Oh, I haven't God. finished yet. Oh, God. Yesterday, I went axe throwing. Ooh. Okay. That was good fun there. And I won. I won the axe throwing with my 32 points. What did you win? My final shot was boom, straight in the number six. Is that good? Is yeah. Six, six, six is good, the is maximum on the, on, the, on the target. Right. And okay. I needed six to, to win. 
Did you win the hand of Maid Marian or no, anything? I didn't win nothing, so I, I won gamble? the admiration of my team colleagues. Did you gamble <laughs> or did you keep what you'd won and give someone else a chance? To be fair, I would have kept what I'd won by that point because I was my eye was my you know there's a certain <laughs> point in these things where you, your eye is right in and it and then then your eye just goes and you can't focus or you can't you you've lost your mojo. Mm-hmm. And did you get it in the black or in the red? I just thought it was quite Yeah, no, that game with two of the red. red. So yeah, that's been my week. Cool. Okay. So, well, that sounds good. Brett? I've been working in a suit and it's really hot and all the PE teachers don't have to wear suits. <laughs> oh, look at me in my shorts and my just parry like FYI, the dog's trying to eat your shorts. No, the reason <laughs> the dog is so quiet and likes to hang around me is it's chewing on my tassel. Yeah. And I'm putting up with that, so he's quiet for the podcast. Oh. Eat my shorts. He is literally eating my shorts. You're 30 years too late, but hey. But yeah, no, I've just been. Dog! Work, 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 work. <laughs> and then on Saturday, I went to a party. Oh, I had a barbecue on Friday with a friend's house. And then on Saturday, I went to another friend's house uh, who was a four year old mermaid. And we rocked, and it was a cool party. Cool. And then the shark turned up and started bullying people. And yeah, I noticed around. that. Because I too went to that same birthday party. and There was cake. I didn't have the cake. It had frosting on it. Or icing. I don't like icing. It's buttercream icing. It wasn't... It's, it's fine. Like I, I, I had some of the chocolate so on top. Okay. Fair yeah. Enough. I was happy. Mm. Cool. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. That was a good day. And a good night. Yeah. Thanks to the hosts. Whoever they were, I never saw them as a shark outfit. <laughs> okay. Extremely hot shark outfit. <laughs> yeah, now you've lost five stars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's on that day. So that's what we've been doing. Have you been managing to watch anything, Damien? As last week, I'll be really quick. No, I haven't watched any television at all I for think, two weeks now. I think we can probably forgive you after the week that you've had. Yeah. Mm. Although, if you haven't watched any television for three weeks, we start to wonder why you're doing a podcast on TV. <laughs> so next week, be honest, you, you only keep me on this podcast because I'm the one that does all the producing. You, not, none of you have no, the, you keep the us technical honest. nails you, to do it. And you keep us honest. And you also have a really nice garage with a bar <laughs> and an outside broadcast facility. Chegas. Yeah. Fair enough. And you're the hostess with the mostest. Yeah. Yeah, that's I it. believe every it's word of what you've just said. The Prime Minister Hashtag has be kind. The Prime Minister <laughs> has checkers and we've got checkers. Yeah, I like that. Hello. Let's go with that. Okay, so Summers, over to you. Have you managed to watch anything in between I, sweating in the uh, classroom? And I that? have been at school in media at the moment. We're currently reinvestigating the tale of... Um, Brown the Rabbit. Young, no, the, the, the young person's adventure in relation to story placement, story construction, and how it's changed over the years and how it hasn't changed, i.e. normally they get rid of the parents first and then the child goes off somewhere, maybe a school or some sort of thing, meets other friends, new places, new enemies and stuff like that. So yeah, we're watching Harry Potter at the moment. Um, so I'm going through those. <laughs> it is part of the yeah, it is part of the curriculum because you, you link it Harry back. Harry Potter is part of the Potter. curriculum. Yeah. What, all of them? I had to study Harry Potter when I'd done my literature degree. It was the only book I'd already read. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't no, like the whole, the whole thing of it is the, the concept of children's literature and how the basic story hasn't changed since like, you know, like Edith Blight and whatever. Like they go away to the aunties, whereas Harry goes away to the school. Yeah. You know, it's the basic formula going back to C.S. Lewis and how that's not changed over centuries yeah, really a valid point yeah, yeah. You're and, right. and, the, and the storyline structure of that and has it developed more over the years or not cool and most of them haven't so and you've been watching that new film called harry harry potter was it yeah harry potter cool we're up to the third one although interestingly is it the third one or is it the fourth one now the one with the dude from twilight in it when he gets murked. goblet fire that's the, the one where one. he gets murked as the kids say goblet fire i've killed. not seen any of them gets, or read any of the books he so. gets killed well, he gets murked. Good. That's the street talk down our ends. Murked. Um, murked. M A R K E D. What does that mean? It means like he's been murked. Like a mercenary. He's dead. Oh, he's okay. Killed. Okay. No, mercenary. Okay. Murked. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's that one. But as it's getting a bit darker, 
they are actually responding to that and to me it's just another one of the films like, yeah they do get a bit dark as he gets older they kind of yeah. get a bit scary in that but it's quite interesting how the kids are a little bit more oh that's a bit oh and I didn't think children would be affected by that as much see how much better that sounds <laughs> can you hear how much better and fuller that richer that sound is when you talk into anything. the microphone okay move on unlike Harry Potter G- unlike Jim Mother um, yeah so watch a bit of that and that's cool but for my own personal viewing um, I've been uh, catching up on From Season 2 and uh, you boys need to be watching it when it comes out because it's getting very good so last well, maybe not last week but the last time you talked about it you said it was um, I was saying that it needs, needs to start to doing yeah, yeah it's so that, it's done that is it it's doing that have we, have we got <laughs> answers no but there are things that are happening that I didn't think would happen yet so in some ways it's the old you know it's the I don't know I think part of it they're doing the old art of illusion look at this hand well this hand's doing something else you know and it's and, it, and it's working <laughs> cool. and I do feel it is going to be one of those when you go back later on and you're like, oh yeah, it was, it was right there in front of us. We nearly lost Billy then. <laughs> but, um, and also, I went back to your roots. And um, I Going found. Because I had this. I was doing something, and this film came into my head that I'd watched. <laughs> many, this, many, this many, I don't know what you were doing or what that film was. <laughs> and it was us talking the other week about. Um, and we'll probably go over this later on about when we said the blob and I, I was going back looking for stuff on the Deadly Ernest Horror Show from Sky and I, I found some clips of it and um, but there isn't a lot and it's normally it's like the bits in between you know like the bits with them in rather than the films but, um, but there was a it, there was a film in it and I was trying to find out what it was because it was I remembered it it had to do with fear and it had Linda Blair in it and I've found it now and I've watched it and it's really freaky. It's called, well, we got it in the UK as a cinema release as Summer of Fear. Whereas in America, it was like a TV movie type thing and it was called Stranger oh, in Our House. It was called Stranger in Our House. So that's where I think a lot of the confusion was because it had different names wherever you were. And I think in some other countries it was called other things because they just. You know, that's what people did in those days. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was one of the, I think it was the third film that Wes Craven had ever directed. Oh. Round about Last House on the Left, might have been around this time. And again, it's a TV movie, but it was a bit weird. And they were like, I don't think anyone else, no, because they just used to just buy in loads of scripts, didn't they? And go, yeah. right, you're going to make that one, you're going to yep. make that one, and all that. And um, I don't think many people were like, I don't want to do this, because most TV movies were sort of detective or lovey-dovey stuff na- nowadays you see on the Hallmark Channel and um, and they were like I'll give it about West Craven guy you can have a go at this <laughs> and um, yeah no it's it's really good um, you've got Linda Blair she plays um, Rachel Bryant she's like this young girl who oh it's based off a novel as well by Louise Duncan sorry and um plays this young horse loving girl who what are you gonna say so did I. Yeah and <laughs> <laughs> Whoa there. And uh, her horse is called um Sundance, obviously. And um her cousin turns up called Julia, played by Lee Purcell, and she comes to stay. And Julia's kind of she's got that charm about her, but also there's a, a bit of menace to her. You're not quite sure, do you like her, do you trust her? And then like weird things start happening to Rachel and she gets like she finally gets a date with the boy she likes and she comes up and all these like poxy things and then then something horrible happens to the horse and then I think her friend there's like the guy she knows who lives across the road who's like a professor of like satanism who was like trying to help her work something out he he dies suddenly and it's all like and um and then it's sort of Julia you know who is Julia and it's all a bit supernatural and witchy and spooky. And for a TV movie, where they were only allowed to do so much because it was broadcast, they get away with a lot. But they don't always show it, but it's there as well. And it's it's kind of very, I don't know, I'm surprised they made it. It's very dark for 
I think it was ABC and then NBC put it on as well because it done so well. It was and most TV movies in those days were throwaway, kind of one and done. And this one was like, yeah, one network. I can't remember the one network that showed it. Then the other one bought it and showed it. And then the people were like, we should put this out. And then we got it at the cinema over here and around the world. So they it kind of came up and it, it's never. I think there's a DVD of it somewhere, like an uncut one, that done the rounds a few years ago. That's a few quid on eBay now, if you can find it. But it's one of those that we get as a TV movie. It might just pop on. It's BBC Two will probably show it at two o'clock in the morning one night, and you'd miss it and all that. But no, really good, very creepy, and um, definitely worth a watch. If not for the fact that you like horror, just how much hairspray is in it? Because <laughs> Linda Blair's hair. She's grown up since The Exorcist, and she's kind of got a full-on Brian May all the way round. And then the other girl, come, um, the cousin Julia, her hair is massive as well. And there is actually a really good bit where they do have a fight, and she's like, "Don't touch my hair," which you know, girls have. Um, no, anyway, I just miss saying that now. I don't have any, but yeah, really good if you can find it. You may find it around on other places where you might find videos online unofficially you know like youtube or whatever but i do i do have a full review of it on our website cultfaction.com and there are some links on there to the trailers and things so but a freaky film that haunted me in my past and i finally tracked it down and worked out what it was cool anything, anything else no nope. okay that's what i was making the most of that <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I watched uh, Evil Dead Rise. Ooh. Didn't you watch that last week and talk about it? No, that was Saturday. Okay. Alright, fair enough. Yeah. Careful. So you're excited about this? I was excited about it. Yeah, that's we, what I'm saying. We, like, we did um, Army of Darkness, Darkness a couple of weeks ago. And I've got to admit, it's gone back to its roots. Um, and it's a proper horror film. It starts off with some of the familiar low camera scenes, but like chasing you around, yeah. Yeah. Uh, But then it goes full on modern horror, set in an apartment block. Uh, the Necronomicon uh, is found in, in almost a vault uh, by um, a couple of kids. They bring it back. Obviously, they open it up. Things start going wrong, um, and I'm not going to give anything away because uh, I don't do spoilers um, but I enjoyed it and uh, I think it may be another stepping stone for more in the genre to come along um, without the comedy there was no comedy in this one it was pure full-on horror gore weird mu mutations yeah. all that kind of good stuff I did read somewhere that um, Raimi Bruce Campbell and the people who had done that one had, had sat down somewhere and were trying to map out the I don't know what we call it, the Evil Dead multiverse universe thing or whatever you call it so it looks like it might have brought Bruce Campbell back to the table because he's retired from playing Ash didn't he so you never know could be good I, I look forward to what what would you give it uh, I'd probably given it a seven cool yeah which I think is actually quite good for a horror film in these days, this day and age. Yeah, especially, you know, most of them aren't horror anymore. They yeah, laugh and, crap. laugh and mock them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the other one I watched on Netflix was The Wonder with Florence Pugh. Yeah, I like Florence. Yeah, so do I. And so she plays an English nurse that goes over to Ireland for a, um, a couple of weeks um, to look after a child, or well, that's what she thinks. Basically, the kid hasn't eaten, allegedly, in years, um, and it's just been surviving on um, manna from heaven, as she puts it. So uh, a, a little committee of all the different um, seniors in the town, including, uh, you know, the, the local, elders. Yeah, it, yeah, in this little town in cool. Ireland, get her and a nun to take an eight-hour shift just to make sure that the kid isn't eating, and obviously not to stop her. Um, but just to see if this is like a, a holy thing or, or whatever. Um, I I did like it. It was a bit different. It, it starts off a bit weird for no reason whatsoever because I think it's a, <laughs> no, it's, it's like an independent film. But it starts off and it's actually on the set, and it introduces the film, 
and they go straight into Florence Pugh uh, on the set in the boat and she's just eating and it ends on the set and I don't know why they bothered doing that it just felt really out of place um, and you know in the back of your head you couldn't you always had it playing around so it's like you couldn't really get into the film in such a way as if they'd have just left it out yeah uh, yes. yeah that's a strange thing to do yeah but other it well, almost my, my harks back to like um, Shakespeare where he has people introducing the story yeah they and say I'm, what happens and I'm not sure yeah. whether it was like you know harking back to that but anyway it, it's worth the watch it's a bit different um, it's not really a horror it's more of a it's not even crime it's more of an investigation into to what's going on with this girl and whether she is has been given you know powers or whether something else is afoot cool mm -hmm. cool and that's basically been about it apart from because I dressed up as Aquaman on Saturday I watched Aquaman on Friday and getting character yeah um, and I there was one particular actress that looked really wooden and cardboard um, <laughs> and I'm not sure whether that's because I've seen her act better in real life now in court for instance yeah <laughs> but, but anyway that's it Right. So this week's spotlight is on the blog, which is a 1958 American independent science fiction horror film directed by Irvin Yeworth, Yeworth, and written by Kay Ginnaker and Theodore Simonson. It was made on a budget of about $110,000. Paramount bought the rights to the film for about $300,000 and spent about the same amount on promoting the film. Uh, when the blog premiered as the B film on a double feature, can you imagine that? A double feature? <laughs> yeah. Don't get that anymore. Uh, a double it never happens now. Well, particularly in the Marvel Universe, can you imagine that? Six, seven hours in, oh, in a Jesus cinema. <laughs> so it was a double it's feature. A whole weekend now. With Sorry. I Married a Monster from Outer Space. Mm. Mm. Haven't we all? Uh, it was quickly moved up to the main feature as it was a hit with the teenage youths uh, of the time. Uh, critics were not so impressed, but nonetheless, it went on to make over a four mil at the box office. Uh, the film's tongue-in-cheek title song, The Blob, was written by some of, some of you may know, Burt Bacharach and Mac David. It became a na uh, nationwide hit in the US and helped Rocket Bacharach's incredibly successful music career over the next probably six, seven Hundred decades. Hundred years. <laughs> yeah. Um, so running through the main cast. Um, so it starred Steve McQueen in his first feature film leading role as Steve Andrews. Now Steve, I call him Steve, but he was known as Stephen McQueen uh, in the credits. He received... Three thousand dollars for starring in the uh, in the film, uh, but he turned down an offer of a smaller upfront fee and ten percent of profits, as he thought the film wouldn't be a success. Um, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but he did need money for food and rent, so let's forgive him and let's be honest, his career didn't really yeah, he struggle didn't suffer from <laughs> making that decision, really, did he? Yeah, I can. Alec Guinness read that somewhere once. <laughs> Uh, so it also starred uh, Anita uh, Corso as Jane Martin, Earl Rowe as Lieutenant Dave Barden. The nice Ollen, sheriff. Yeah. <laughs> Olin Howland, uh, credited, uh, credited as Olin Howland as Barney, the old man. Uh, Stephen Chase as Dr. T. Hallen. John Benson as Sergeant um, Jim Burke. Uh, George... Uh, Jim Burke. Jim Burke. Uh, Jim... <laughs> so I've been locked licked by a dog. Uh, George Karras as Officer Ritchie no way to speak about from out of space. <laughs> and some others. Uh, the Blob went on to spawn a sequel, Beware the Blob, in 1972, directed by Larry Hackman, and a remake in 1988, along with appearing in, influencing in, um, and being referenced in a horde of films, TV, and pretty much popular culture <laughs> since it was released. 
But what did we think of it at Confection? So first of all, memories. Uh, it's just a film that's always existed. and I Well, seen technically only since 1950. No, you know what I mean. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I know I've watched it multiple times <clears throat> growing up. It's, I went probably not sat down and start that again. Not purposely put it on to sit down and watch it, but have flicked over on the TV and it's been on, that kind of thing. Um, but it doesn't necessarily hold a place in my heart or anything like that. So. Okay, Mr. Summers. Um, I remember it as being, I me well, I remember the poster more for years, um, and you used to just see it in like different like horror books and horror things and magazines that had always like, you know, the blob was always like a, a presence in these. And then many, many years ago in the UK when Sky was just Sky Channel, dog based out in Hilversum in Holland before it became the the sky that we know now it was, it, was, when it was a little dial on the wall one of the channels of Sky Channel and on Fridays at about 11 o'clock they used to have the Deadly Earnest Horror Show where some Patriot girl and some actor bloke whose name I forget now um, would, would dress up like sort of Dracula and his bride and would introduce different horror movies and horror specials and TV movies and that from all over the place and obviously one of them was The Blob and for some reason I was always allowed to watch these films at 11 o'clock even at a young age yeah. and um, I took them like five or six and I, and I remember watching The Blob and it wasn't one of the most scariest ones but it was always just really cool and I think it was it was an innovator I think the trailer was probably more innovative than the film was because it basically it's just something about space and rats, which we'll get to. But the trailer was very clever because it was like, wrong, walk, don't run, from the blow and all the people screaming and what. And it looked like it was almost done like it was news footage and things like that. So, um, I, yeah, I never remember that. And I just remember it was really cool. And then I remember they did the next one. And I'm sure I saw a son of the blob. <laughs> might not have been an official because it was really, you know, it was all sorts of films from around the place. Might have been one of those Italian ones or these Turkish ones where they rip it off. But um yeah, and yeah, it was it was cool because there's this big thing that like took in everything and got in its path. Yeah. So the only bit that I actually remember physically watching as part of the film, because I think like all of us we must have seen clips of different parts in other, you know, popping up on TV or in other films. Um, but I always remember the, the very start where the guy's prodding it with a stick and it gets his hand. And there was a long while as a kid, I, I was scared of anything gelatinous. <laughs> so you didn't eat jelly for a little while? I hated jelly. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's, it's films leave impressions on yeah, them. It's, it's, it's why I hate going swimming in the sea. Not because of the blob, because of yours. Okay, cool. So we're going to do what we normally do, run through the plot um, bit by bit and obviously give our little take on what we've, uh, what we've witnessed as we were watching the film. Now, I think we need to keep in mind, similar to Invaders from Mars for our listeners, this film was, you know, uh, as we said, released in 1958. So a lot of the characterizations are very much of the time. Um, lots of the, the social... Um, workings uh, are, are probably a bit different to, to today so how that. how kids look about 50 to start with um, yeah it's about 28 when yeah latest so yeah um, uh, yeah they look about the same age as parents um, uh, and obviously the interaction between cops or police officers kids well, and or adults and adults and youths yeah exactly um, but it was mad down their ends. It was. <laughs> <laughs> but, but let's go through it. Oh, that's me starting, isn't it? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't make him bold because I was doing it on the notepad. Okay, fair do. So the jovial opening music of "Beware the Blob." It creeps, it leaps, it glides, it slides across the floor, and trippy, almost psychedelic, swirling red lines. Which I have to be honest, I kind of skipped because I was really tired when I was watching. <laughs> 
to it. I don't need that song part of the film. I'd, I'd the forgotten track. about the song altogether, so <laughs> I was quite pleasantly pleased. Okay, so in a small Pennsylvania town, teenager Steve Andrews and his girlfriend Jane Martin kiss at Lover's Lane on the hunt for shooting stars. When they see a meteorite crash beyond the next hill, Steve goes looking for it. But Barney, an old man living nearby, finds it first. Barney, never having seen a horror film about gelatinous alien life forms, decides to poke it with the spherical smoking meteorite with a stick. It brings open a small jelly-like blob inside. It attaches itself to the stick and then attaches itself to the old timer, as they called him later on in the film. <laughs> it attaches it to the old timer's hand. In pain and unable to scrape or shake it loose, Barney runs onto the road where he's nearly struck by Steve's car. Steve and Jane find Barney with the substance on his hand and drive him to Dr. Haddon. I mean, let's be fair, these are, these are responsible kids. <laughs> Nowadays, yeah. they'd have just shouted abuse at him and just carried on driving, or well, reversed and tried to knock him down. Well, not only that, they're, they're, they're on you know, uh, Lover's Lane or whatever they, they call it. They're having a nice conversation. Steve's being a true gent, you know, He's just talking about shooting stars and uh, you know. There's a clue there though. This is about oh, there's always one more, there's more than one. She's just about like, he's been there before <laughs> and, not, and not with her. I know, but she said he says he's never taken anyone else up here. He comes up here on his own to watch the shooting stars. It's dogging. <laughs> not with Barney the old timer. But I like it though. You get your small town America vibe. They know where the doctor is, even at whatever time of night it is. Small it's good that they know where the doctor is. I reckon they'd also know where the mic is. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Who's the mic? Is he a character? That's really cool. But the only thing all the way through this is, what time is this now? I know. Yeah, I was thinking that. Because <laughs> it's like, they go in and get a bed later, or sorry, and then sneak out. So what time were they on date? Because it was late then, and then uh, it just gets Yeah, crazy. but they were, they were kids. So it would have been early. It could have, could have been, you know... But the other dark. kids are at the cinema. Yeah, yeah, but that's for a midnight showing. So we know that? Yeah. Yeah, he okay. does say that. He says okay. we're going to the midnight creature okay, feature. I missed that. And also, but you're right. It's like a lot happens and then all of a sudden it's bedtime. But what time is it? Yeah, what time yeah. is bedtime? When, when does it get dark then? Chico time. It's just like that bit of the EastEnders where you see him in a nightclub for ages and then they leave and it's still daylight outside and yeah. the market's going on and then they go to the other part it's like you've just been there for 20 minutes have a few kids. yeah time is weird in this town but it's okay I like it but anyway a uh, big responsible Steve overtakes some local ruffians Youths. in a racing game and passes them at 55 miles per hour and upsets them they arrive at Dr. Oh, uh, there, then Stephen and um, Jane arrive at Dr. Hales with the old timer and he examines Barney. The blob has got bigger. The doctor gives him a shot of anaesthetic and asks Steve and Jane to go back to the crater and find out more about what happened. Because, you know, that's what you do. <laughs> Send some kids back down there. And then the local youth from earlier that he raced past confront Steve for taking his crown because he, he was faster and won a race he didn't realise he was in. Yeah. And just like, you know, car racing was big in the 50s, just like a rush, rush, Paul Rebels music video and Rebel that course. So Steve has to accept the challenge and the red car and the blue car have a race. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. But backwards. And Steve stops and the red car has to wait for the traffic lights whilst the local police officer turns up and gives Steve a stern telling off, even threatening to tell his father. It's a bit different nowadays, he'd have been tasered and shot. <laughs> Steve confesses, oh no he wouldn't have. <laughs> no. Sorry. no. Steve, Steve confesses and he gets a warning as long as there's no more horseplay, young man. You crazy kids. Yeah, so then the youths wave down Steve and they're all friends again. And were friends, even though it was made up that they kind of weren't friends, but then suddenly they're all just friends again. Yeah. And they recite a, a witty tale, and Steve tells him he has a job to do for the Doctor and convinces them to tag along. So very weird. This was this was clearly um, 
script writing for young people by people who weren't young. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Like car racers. When was this? Was fifty-eight. Fifty-eight. And Rebel obviously was filmed in fifty-seven. Probably written in fifty-five, fifty-six. When was Rebel Without a Cause? That was a bit before, wasn't it? That was oh, 55. So, yeah, not far off each other. So, you get that kind of, cause it is that sort of, still that small town vibe with the young people being the young people and the adults just don't understand it's young people, yeah. man. Well, I mean, the script is awful, we've got to be honest. It's the, 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 the interaction between that the, those two groups is just terrible. Well, it, we see it a lot more as well. Um, as you know, you've got some of the adults that all they see in the youth is trouble. But there's a, there's a, it's similar to um, Vader's from Mars. But one of the, you know, the, the 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 police chief, he sees the good in Steve, and he sees the good in youth. Yeah, yeah there is to some extent. There, but there, there, there is a clear though sort of social message that is hammered through this, and you get that. Which again probably was a thing at the time because this was the birth of the teenager. Yeah. And you get that, and probably within the writing of the people that did it for the teenagers, just that gap, that, that age gap that's now developed. And yeah, like you say, there were there were like proteins, ooh, and like. Well, this is written by teams. people that have potentially gone through two world wars. And one world cup. <laughs> um, so yeah, but they you know they they. <laughs> They never had the yeah never had it yeah the so teenage um, era because they were either well it was straight, straight, straight on working exactly straight, on straight, straight to, yeah. yeah so this is yeah now you're right and it, and it does show and, it, and it's an interesting snapshot like you were saying it was the values and the culture at the time and I think between this Rebel Without a Cause and there's probably a couple of others I can't think of now you do get that. The only thing that lets it down is that all the teenagers are played with thirty-year-olds. Yeah, but you do get that vibe of maybe what it was like in those days, and it does capture it well here. Although by the end of it, it starts to just really hammer it a little bit too hard. Yeah, yeah. but but so hey, let's come on to that. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I, I was teasing. I okay, was foreshadowing. So things are getting worse for Barney, and Doc Hallen decides he's going to have to amputate the man's arm. Since it's being, oh, I thought I gave this line to Brett. Since it's being <laughs> for ghosts mm, Yeah, that's okay. right. That's the word he uses. The youths find the crater and start tossing the meteorite, uh, meteorite remains around. They go hunting for more. Um, they hear a dog barking at a nearby house. They let the dog out and decide to head back into the town. Steve and Jane kidnap the dog uh, and take <laughs> it back with them. The doc brings in Nurse Kate um, for, for some help, but the blob has completely absorbed Barney. You see a bit of this in the background as they're talking, there's little movements yeah. underneath the, the um, uh, blanket, and is now a big moving red ball. Uh, the nurse throws acid at the blob at the doctor's orders, um, and, and, it, uh, and nothing happens, there's no effect. Dr. Hallam goes and gets his shotgun, <laughs> And the blob gets its next victim, Nurse Kate. The doc keeps shooting, but again, it proves futile. Blob. Yeah, this was kind of a weird setup, just for them to take a dog, and then <laughs> what happens next? <laughs> they actually seem quite cruel. Um, I feel sorry for Nurse Kate. It was clearly a big moment for her career. But yeah, it didn't last long. <laughs> Yeah. Well, not only that, but it's like the doc stood there, gets her to throw the acid, you know, <laughs> and, uh, over to you. Oh, and now I'm going to get my shotgun. Yeah. Now, there is a little bit of that through the film as well, where, like, you know, it's the old, the, the woman know your limits thing. And they're like, oh, look, the woman has suggested yeah. something. Let's look at her a bit silly. That's nice, dear. <laughs> you know, it, there is a little bit of that sneaking in. But, um, but we're definitely getting... The danger that the blob poses to and the village, the town, human life in general. And one thing we haven't mentioned at the moment is the effects. So this is the first time we see the blob as like a, well, a, a blob, a proper uh, gelatinous blob in its own right, as opposed to being attached to Barney. 
Um, I thought for the time they actually looked all right. Yeah. Made the most of what they had available to them. Yeah. Definitely. It still exists as well, apparently. I dream about it today. Right. It's never you, dried out. They you, keep it. You can't <laughs> kill it, Brett. <laughs> no, but that you can still actually go and see that blog, uh, the original. For some reason, but <laughs> but yeah. Okay, cool. Let's move on then, shall we? On that bombshell. Yeah. Steve and Jane return in time for Steve to witness the Doctor trying to escape through the window with the blob covering him. The blob is getting bigger and bigger with each victim. They go to the police station. And after convincing the cops he's not pulling a prank, they return with Lieutenant Dave Barton and Sergeant Jim Burt, but they find no sign of the blob or its victims. Just a lot of mess and a fired shotgun. Skeptical Burt dismisses Steve's story as a wind-up that Tony and the gang are playing. Mrs. Porter starts interfering and shoes everyone out so she can tidy up and tells them the doc has gone to, away to a conference in the next town along. The next scene takes us to the garage where mechanic tells his buddy how he's going to get so roaring drunk this weekend. Marty leaves and he continues fixing the car, talking to himself as the blob attacks him and absorbs him too. Steve and Jane's parents turn up at the police station. Steve tries to convince his dad that some monster killed Dr. Hallam. Steve and Jane are taken home. Everything's going to get sorted out in the morning, we are told several times. I, I love the character of, um, what was her name? I missed it. I've already forgotten it. Mrs. Porter. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. no one's arguing with Mrs. Porter, are they? No. She's not listening. She's belligerent. I want to tidy up. Yeah, yeah. We, need, we might need fingerprints. I'll dust around the fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> just brilliant. And the doc's fine. I heard him. He, he was on a phone call. He's gone away. It's like, uh, and then Steve's saying, well, check the garage. His car's still in there, I bet you. It's like, and it's like, oh, you little kid. No, he sometimes doesn't take his car. I bet he's gone with the other doctor, actually. Yeah. Like, yeah. Are, are you in on it? Are you in on it? I've to watch the comments. Jane is, is just deadly quiet. Yeah. At no point does she pipe up and say, I saw the doctor too. We were, we were here yeah. less than half an hour That's ago. Right. Here's a dog somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Did she even say when they ask her, she's like, um, I didn't really see it. She didn't see what happened to, to the doctor. doctor. But she yeah. saw she was, everything. She, she, saw, yeah, what, no, she saw the old timer. She saw the plot. Yeah. She was like, well, you're, you're a big Plays dog. no part in trying to convince them that, that Steve's not lying. It's, Steve does this all the time. Yeah. And the good old mechanic as well. He, yeah. He's getting raw. Yeah, he's, he's looking forward to his fishing trip <laughs> where he's going to get so rip roaring drunk. I wouldn't want him working on my car. No. There you go. Small town America at its finest, where everyone knows everyone's business. And similarly, we're getting the old dad saying, well, this isn't like Steve to make up stuff, but let's go home. And, you know, and as they keep saying, everything will be all right in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Well, little do they know. But everything's going to be fine after a good night's sleep. Yeah, and a cup of tea. I know that, that's, that's, that's English, that's isn't English, it? English, isn't it? Yeah. We'll sit down, we'll have a cuppa, we'll yeah. sort this out in the morning. But it is very much, yeah, you know, head to the Winchester, wait for it to blow yeah. over, isn't it? It is that sort of... But so many people, again, they just don't that's listen to the kids. Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> if only they listened. If only they listened. But anyway, so everyone goes home, but James and Steve, right? They only sneak out. Jane's brother Danny spots her as she's sticking out and tells her he's not off Wade and he wants to go with her. She says no and he has to protect the house so she sort of leaves him there. Steve hears his parents whisper in the next room but they fail to notice him climb out of his window, bump into Jane below and uh, continue talking outside. Steve starts questioning himself and whether he saw what he saw and whether it was real and what he thinks he saw and Jane tells him she believes him even though she like half an hour ago just absolutely hung him out yeah. the and they need to keep trying to convince people by finding proof Steve then gets out the, gets out the car out of the garage pushing it to not make a noise until he gets out the driveway which is probably the cleverest bit that no one ever does in a film 
and they actually did it. Yeah. But then the other one just jump and rip away, and no one hears it. Yeah. And yeah. Like, the tires screech, but still no one wakes up. Part of me was like, is the car broke? <laughs> <laughs> and they went out of touch with his seat or something. Right, either that, they got the mechanic to look at it the night before, and it's broken down or something. Yeah, and they, they needed it fixed, but oh, he's on a boat getting hammered somewhere again. Um, then we cut to the Colonial Movie Theatre during the midnight screening of Daughter of Horror with Bella Lugosi. And Steve recruits Tony and, oh, what was that other guy in a weird nickname? Uh, Tony and his no, friend no, I wasn't paying attention to warn names, people to about the blob. So first of all, that would have never happened. They were like, yeah, we'll come out after the film. Yeah. They'll come in there. And we paid like, 80 cents for this yeah. film. <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he, just, he just ran in and then just lured them all out again. And then like, would, would, would they do that? Mooch. That was his name. Mooch. And um, his other friend. And um, yeah, because none of us would have done that. I go, wait till the end. It's the Godfather. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but they do because obviously they're good friends with Steve and the, the and the, the Scooby gang all meet outside and they're going to make sure they're going to wake up the town because um, they, they don't want the blob wiping out everyone whilst they sleep. Yeah, so, so it's gone from, you know, eating one person to yeah, Steve yeah. trying to convince them it's going to wipe out the yeah, whole town. The whole town, it's getting bigger, it's getting better. And they're going to find it, and they're going to make people believe them now. And at the police station, there are more cases of people disappearing. But nothing they can't wait to look <laughs> <laughs> And all you, all you ever get is that sheriff going like, young people. Yeah. yeah. I was in the army. It's because of, my, cause of my, my army record. Do you, th- it was. do you think the police chief didn't want to pay them overtime? So it's like, no, look, everything's going to be right in the morning. Go well, home. Well, it's just <laughs> yeah. that trusty small town thing when nothing ever happens, and then... It does, and they're just not prepared for it. But, you know, if they just listened, it could have been all avoided by now. Oh. If he just let his anger go, he would have been fine. <laughs> the other guy's fucking useless. Yeah. <laughs> Can we do that? Yeah, okay. So was he, that, was he yeah, the one that okay. was playing chess? Yeah, he was just, yeah. Around yeah. just wandering around, like, should I go in there? No. Yeah. So like, okay, I've got, yeah. Yeah, I, do not, I, couldn't be, I couldn't be bothered to rewind it, but I think he lit the same cigarette twice. <laughs> <laughs> I swear blind, it kind of cut. He had him like he lit a cigarette, and then it cut to them to another two characters talking. Went back and he picks up his lighter again and lights a cigarette. Although it was the fifties, people used to smoke a lot. That's true. Maybe, maybe one hour one just running through. Yeah. He's nervous about this, the, these teens and these pranks and this story. Right, moving on. The Utes try to warn lots of basically drunk people or people who just don't want to listen. Uh, so the first lot, drunk people at a house party for some reason. I swear that was a swingers party. It did look a bit dodgy. Um, they got invited in. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There was a, a couple... When you've got your car keys with you, that's why I have it. Come on in. Yeah, and then they find another couple will try and have some alone time in the woods. But it's <laughs> bit... Yeah, that's just random. <laughs> it's just, it's just like, sorry, I was looking for a monster. <laughs> 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 it should have gone, and I found her. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and they also try a barman, um, and he's well. Basically, none of them having having any of it, um, and, and so send them on their way. When Steve notices that his dad's grocery store is unlocked, he and Jane go inside to investigate. The janitor that should be there tidying up is nowhere to be seen. The couple are confronted by the blob. And are quickly cornered by it. Yes, yeah, so we get lots of scenes of randomly jumping on top of. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Jane, oh, Jane awesome. gets shot back into some cans and is yeah. viciously knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, being the gentleman, he carries her. Um, so they're cornered by it and they seek refuge in the walk in freezer. The blob starts oozing under the door but quickly retreats. Hmm. Interesting. Or maybe he's just not hungry, you know. Yeah. Might be vegan. Yeah. Steve and Jane gather their friends again. They call the cops, but they still don't believe them. So now they decide to take things in their own hands and wake the whole town up. And they basically set off the town's fire alarm, set off the air raid siren, uh, and even start honking their own car horns. (laughs) 
which in turn starts waking lots of people up. So you get a, a, a guy that puts on one hat, wears that's, some that's air raid. Yeah, that is, that's classic, that is. And then he hears the fire alarm, so he puts on his fire hat. I've got yeah. a lot helmet to wear. <laughs> um, so the townspeople and the police arrive, and Steve basically tries to warn them all now uh, about this impending doom. Now here's where we get the police chief starting to believe him and he tells everyone to go home and keep listening to the radio for updates. So they've dragged them all into the centre of yeah, town. Yeah, where the blob is. And now the police chief... basically fed the blob. But they're awake yeah. now. They're awake. Okay. That's the... Give them, give them that a little bit. And then the good policeman turns up again as well. So it's... He says, well, that the police chief, man. Yeah, so... We're, we're getting a little listen now. It's not so much of a weird sort of conspiracy anymore. People are, and we're also, for the first time ever, he's admitting things might not be okay until the morning. Yeah, <laughs> listen to your radio. Yeah, but yeah, the, the helmet man was hilarious. I that think, was that's a, that's that is a classic scene. Yeah, definitely. And I did like all the oh, it's these crazy youths just doing something. Why should we listen to young people? They can't say anything productive. And the sheriff's like, no, listen to them. They might be young people, but they might have something to say. Yeah, and in the future, they might even have kids' parliaments and <laughs> what one environmentalist that tries to stand up and stop global warming. Who knows? <laughs> we hadn't had press gang by this point. So oh, that's true. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. So, um, it's not written down here, but he convinces the police to go and investigate inside the shop, but the police find nothing. So again, they're starting to cause a little bit of doubt. Yeah, the cupboard was bare. Yeah. But then, <laughs> the blob enters the theatre and consumes the perfect pr perfectionist, <laughs> whatever that is, the projectionist. <laughs> <laughs> projectionist then oozes into the auditorium Steve is finally finally vindicated when screaming people flee the theatre in panic. That's what we just heard. Then he tries <laughs> shooting the blob with his toy gun, but they flee to the diner. The blob, now enormous from all the townsfolk it's eaten, engulfs the diner. Dave taps on taps into the diner's telephone with his police radio and warns them to shelter in the cellar before the police can shoot down a live power line onto the blob. Uh, they do that, it electrifies the blob, but it has, and still has no effect. But the diner underneath it has been set on fire. Danny's still not afraid, even when smoke starts billowing around them, everyone else outside looks on in horror. Yeah, I like this bit, because you, you finally get evil sheriff's army training coming in with yeah. usefulness with the sniper, or the rifle, whatever it was. He's like, you better be as good a shot as you say, and he was, so he... Kind of redeems yeah. himself a little bit now he's believing. So, but with this, this thing, we're going to do it in 60 seconds. So they get everything set. <laughs> and there's still 30 seconds to go. So they wait. <laughs> oh, like they go, it sounds quiet now, let's just do it. <laughs> there's no, you know, anything, there's, a minute's a long time when you've got yeah. a blob engulfing the diner and you're in there. And what I, I like to I think the panic would be setting in. Uh, little Danny yeah. may have actually invented the shooting using a gun that's ineffective for 101 because <laughs> he does like he does all the shots of his toy gun then when he runs out of toy gun bullets uh, he throws the gun at it and yeah. like, you know everyone does that now yeah he's that's in so many films isn't it yeah so and also the, the other bit i'd like is the scene where they're running all, all running at the cinema because yeah. They're not doing it in the car modelly fashion. They are actually falling over, and you know there, there is some. To be fair though, it looked on. like some of them were having a way of a time. <laughs> some of them got huge beaming smiles on their faces. Like, yeah. Hey, I want a film. I just grabbed some popcorn on the way. Yeah. Up. Yeah, it was a bit like go. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> For those listening and not watching, Brett's just got attacked by a dog. Yeah, something to tune in onto the YouTube for. <laughs> it just, came out of nowhere. It just took out my left nut. Uh, maybe it's going oh. for a mosquito or something. No, it's because I shouted go. Oh. And then he came running at me. <laughs> oh. Um, so, we're at the diner, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, the diner owner, because obviously it's, there's 
those flames. As well, there's not really any flames, but there's smoke around. Actually, yeah. Before we go any further, we need oh. to talk about the Dinorola. He, he he has nothing to say, but whatever it is he's saying is in some sort of weird Italian accent. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it, it, it's showing the cultural diversity <laughs> of the small town. Yeah. The only thing missing for a film of this time would be the Chinese laundrette. <laughs> Just to keep it all yeah. as PC as it would have been then. Oh. Um, but yeah, you've got the diner owner who's, who's not stereotype. Um, battling the smoke and not real fire that's going on. But he's got a carbon dioxide extinguisher. So he's uh, spraying it round on the approaching fire that's coming towards him. Steve notices the blob recoil and then da, 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 remembers it also retreated from the freezer. Eureka. And he realises it cannot tolerate cold temperatures. Shouting in hopes of being picked up on the open phone line, Steve tells Davey Dave the policeman <laughs> about the blob's weakness to cold. And, you know, being firemen, they have a limited supply of CO2 fire extinguishers. <laughs> so everyone starts to panic a little bit. Then Jane's father, the high school principal, Henry Martin, suddenly remembers they've got loads at the school and leads Steve's friends, these hoodlum younglings that no one cared about earlier, to the school where he's forgot his keys. But proving that he's still <laughs> down with the kids as well, he then gets a brick and smashes the door and does the lock, and they get into school. And one of them goes like, "All right." Yeah, so that's that. when they earn his respect. Yeah, so like, smash yeah. the window. And then when they return, a brigade of fire extinguishing armed students, firemen, and police drive the blob away from the diner, freeing the five trapped there, and surround and freeze the creature. You got yeah. enough. There's, there's, there's another. There's a point in this that sort of goes back to how badly, or how under evolved the writing is at this juncture in in cinema history. It's like all the the, the kids run up. We want to help. What can we do? There's just <laughs> there's a line that doesn't need to be there because now it would just be the principal turn around and shouting. We need you to go and get fired, but it's yeah. Yeah. it's there to make exactly. the youth yeah. seem more engaged with what's going and on. Useful. Yeah. Hey, you can come in our cars or whatever. It <laughs> yeah. Is. Like, but yeah, again, we get this generational gap, and I guess it's now been crossed, and everything's okay. Yeah. Everything's going to be all right in that small town forever now. But um, yeah, that did make me laugh. Just go. Oh, got any CO two? No. <laughs> yeah, the fire chief. Yeah, we might have three. And then I like, think we sold all of them to like a school or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do we need them for? And it was yeah, and also some of your dad was the principal. Yeah, it's not been mentioned. It's so. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, it, it worked well, and you know, America came together to fight a big evil menace. A red menace. A that. red menace, or. Ooh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, so the the, the communist conspiracy <laughs> was put to rest. But carry on, sorry, Paul. Okay, so the police request um, the authorities send an Air Force Globemaster, which is a heavy lift cargo aircraft, to transport the frozen blob to the Arctic. Now, this is some, you know... Fork. <laughs> they're, they're not messing around, are they? It's like, yeah, I'm going to phone... You know, the, the powers that be and they're instantly going to believe me yeah. And, yeah. and send, send across even provided stock footage of it <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah so they need to send it to the Arctic um, and you know Dave realises that the cold will stop the blob but not kill it and everyone will be fine as long as the Arctic stays cold mm. Steve Andrews knew what was coming yeah, he had to yeah. see what we, how we were going to retreat the world Anyway, and then we get a final shot of some parachutes that are bearing the blob on a pallet and they lower it into the Arctic ice field with superimposed words, the end, morphing into a question mark. Almost like they could foresee the future. Yeah, they, they saw what mankind would do. Okay. Thoughts, Mr. Summers? 
Um, this is one of those films that is just either a fun piece of tat or a deep kind of metaphor. And, and, it, and there's been dissertations and books written on this now and, you know, like I said, the, 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 the communist thing and the, the menace creeping up on America and all that. But honestly, I think this is another Blade Runner. I don't think any of that was intended at the time. I think loads of people saw meaning in it later and people were yep. like, yeah, that's what we were going for. You know, just like Ridley Scott and Blade Runner. He takes all the credit for everyone's ideas that came up. But that's what you meant. Yeah, that was a, that was a metaphor. The unicorn meant that. No, talking about the blob. Anyway, um, <laughs> back yeah. on track. Back and on track. The blob, sorry, and you're creeping through, and because they've just released another super director's cut. Of this. <laughs> I'm not I've got no anything. interest no, whatsoever. I never, I never did. No. And, um, but yeah, so the blob. I think it's become more. It's grown more into <laughs> something over the years. Than Morphed. They never, that they didn't intend, but at the same time, I can see it and I can see why. And it, you know, and it plays out. It's a cool science fiction film. And Steve McQueen kept the poster on his wall his whole life. So, and he's calling anyone. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's a small town, alien invasion. It gets a bit like Invaders from Mars. It's like Invaders from Mars meets Rebel of Other Cores. <laughs> I need Steve had a cause. Damien. And there was someone called Mooch in it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great <laughs> name. Um, yeah, pretty much the same. I, I don't. I, I never really watch films to find the metaphor and the, all of that nonsense. I did that for film studies. I don't want to do it for the rest of my life when I'm watching a film. So, but. You might like Marvel films. <laughs> 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 Um, it's it's a fun piece of cinema. Uh, generally, I did thoroughly enjoy watching it, even though I've seen it multiple times in multiple um, segments. I still found myself engaged with it, despite all its flaws. The flaws of the yeah, yeah as, as I've already said, the script is it's not the script isn't bad. It's just you know you're, you you. You can't help but compare it to how the script writer has done today. It's more fleshed out. It's more yeah. every character in any film, worth its salt anyway, has more rounded characters than this one does, even when it comes down to the lead. But it is still thoroughly enjoyable. The effects for its time are, are, are great. They're, you know, you don't look at it and go, "That's just awful. They shouldn't have done it." None of that. You know, yeah, we, you can see that the yeah, you can see some of it when it's the box and that kind of the, stuff. Yeah, the um, the diner, it's clearly um, some, it's painting or, or whatever they did with it. I don't know, but that doesn't matter because you've got to put that in context. So yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Cool, it's worth watching again. Yeah, so I'm pretty much the same. I really enjoyed watching it. It's really good bubblegum TV. Um, it had its faults. Um, uh, as we've mentioned uh, I, th I think throughout this but again put myself back into the 50s you know I would go and watch put it yourself the back into the 50s yeah if I could go back oh, to the 50s you were there do it mooch um, then I'd have gone to watch this at a drive-in <laughs> um, and yeah I think it you know yes it's a bit dated in some aspects but I just loved watching it it was just I didn't have to think about anything. Exactly. Um, and, you know, yes, there was tension. Not and really. it moves along at a pretty decent pace as well. well. It, it, it does. And actually, because it's only something like 82 minutes yeah. or something like that. And they still allow for dialect between Steve and uh, Jane. Dialogue. A uh, dialogue, yeah. Uh, between Steve and Jane at the start and throughout the The only dialect the in there is that weird <laughs> Italian that um, the diner guy speaks. Um, and yes, you do get some of the hammy um, lines, but I forgive it. Um, and I think Steve McQueen actually played a bit of a blinder as being a really nice guy um, who saved the town, even though no one believed him, not even himself at times. And it is that thing, isn't it? It is that it's almost a timeless story in a way with, with the whole plot of it. 
it doesn't you know it could be nowadays it could be then obviously we've got mobile phones and in the internet now but the, the, the basic the yeah, microphones and people are pointing you but um you know it could be same as vase from us as well it, though, though it's one of those pure science fictions where the, the story concept could be dropped into any historical period yeah. and it would be a cool story and i think similarly for a lot of other horror films and sci-fi films there is this indestructible thing that no one can beat but just by chance they find a way of yeah. Well, not destroying it in this case, but stopping it. Yeah. Definitely. Cool, okay. Scores on the doors, Mr. Summers, then. Ooh. I think so. I'm just really excited because I just really, I'm just looking and beware the blob with the sequel that you mentioned there, where it's also released as Son of Blob. So that oh, probably was the one I saw. <laughs> I, saw, I, saw, I saw. I saw Son of the Blob. Um, so I'm really excited now. But, um,. Scores of the doors. Oh, it's a seven or work. I'll probably go as a, about a seven, I think, because it again, it's enjoyable. It's one of those ones I think it'll probably once a year or so, where if it's on, you'll sit there and watch it. Um, oh, I meant to say there was one bit. Sorry, that I thought my screen was going weird because it was Steve McQueen stood there with some of the teenagers, and I thought if it's supposed to be a fire or something going on behind them. But when I looked it up, apparently there's a bit where he's got a cigarette behind his back. <laughs> and it smoked. Apparently he smoked all over it, but he wasn't allowed to smoke because... Yeah, whatever. kids didn't do that, yeah, unless yeah. they were ruffians. And, um, yeah, he would have been a bad boy. And um, so there's a bit like later on in the film where they're all stood there talking. I think it's when they're like, hey, we need to wake up the town. And my, yeah, my screen went, just sort of went, and I thought, oh, is it? Is the blob making everything on fire or something? And yeah, he had a cigarette on, on the go. Cheeky, <laughs> cheeky Steve. But yeah, no, I think yeah, a good seven because it's it stands the test of time. Um, the trailer is always amazing and groundbreaking, and the film, the plot of the film, could be dropped into any point in history and still be good. I would like to see it in Egyptian times. Can you imagine the blob, you know, attacking the pyramids or something like that? They'd have a cool. real hard job freezing it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. They're quite clever. They, no, yeah, I'm not saying they won't. Be clever. Yeah. They probably pushed it through the Stargate. No, oh, that's true. Yeah, or the alien overlords would have helped them out. Yeah. <gasps> Can you imagine that? Blob v the alien. Mm. Anyway, Damien. Yeah, that's that's a tangent that I'm not prepared to go down right now. Um, <laughs> my rating, I think um, I'm going to go eight. As I said, I thoroughly enjoyed watching it. You mentioned it, it is a seminal um, sci-fi film, and you can also you can see its influence in. So many others. Yeah. Yeah, but I was brushing a mosquito. <laughs> there's, there's a mic there, Daniel. Shut it. Um, you can see its influence in other films. I can't. Uh, Gremlins, for example, yeah. when they're in the police station, that's a, that is. It's not a shot, but it's. You it's know, it's pretty, pretty much. Out of space took the whole opening. Yeah. And so there's on purpose. Yeah. So many. Um, in, uh, yeah, it's callbacks, references, whatever you want to call them. So I'm going for eight because I did thoroughly enjoy it. I'm going to go 7.5. 7.5? Oh, yeah. It's a 10.5. No, <laughs> not quite. No, 10.5, uh, just because I think, um, you know, we <laughs> are invaders from Mars. <laughs> did, we, did we kidnap the dog? Um, we had invaders from Mars. Like, uh, invaders Sorry, from Mars. that is the point. We didn't really talk about it. What was the point in taking the, the dog even being in well, the like, Well, they took it. Then like, we the thought dog. it was dead, but then yeah. someone saw it running down the road. But, yeah. but don't forget, Danny wanted a dog. That was all Jane's cunning plan from the get-go. Her brother wanted a dog. This is true. She saw a dog, kidnapped the dog. Danny gave uh, had the dog. Did they give the dog to Danny at the end? Probably. No, one of the... One of the like Mooch or one of the gang said, Oh, we saw this dog running yeah. down the road. That's, like the, that's the last we hear of the dog, isn't it? Yeah, but they'll find it. That's what they should have done. They should, that's 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 where it falls down. Mm. They should have given the dog. And that's Danny. where John Carpenter picked them up and <laughs> used it later. Yeah, no, um, I think it was a great film and I'd quite happily watch it again. Probably not every year, so there's to be no. fair. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think it stands the test of time. Definitely does. And just, I'd just like to go on record and say that whilst I said that the plot could be dropped in at any historical point in time and still be good, it wasn't in 1988. No, it wasn't. <laughs> but 
then they changed it, didn't they? Because in in that one, it turned that it wasn't. Was it now? It was a, wasn't it a biological? I don't think I've seen them to be perfect. I think they play it like it was a biological form Weapon that escapes rather than it's like from space. I can't remember. But anyway, that's a different film. And Echo of Dawn. And so there is a remake, but don't worry. And apparently Rob Zombie was going to do one, but it's all fallen through. But, but uh, well, yeah. you never know. You could, the blob will return. Okay, so that was the Cult Faction podcast, episode 100, with a spotlight on the blob. But that was Before this week. Before we shut, start our shutdown procedure. So, Mr. Summers, this <laughs> this week we've been on the blob. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Do I keep that in or not? I don't know. Oh, it's, it's on YouTube, so. So this uh. week we've been. <laughs> Sorry, you put me off there, but we've been focusing on the blob. As, as ever, we, we go around and have someone else choosing the film for oh, the following yeah. week, where you can play at home, listeners and watchers. Um, so, Mr. Summers, your choice for next week. I've been padding as long as I yeah. can. Yeah, I know. And I'm there. Mine, I will take you next week to a quite recent film from 2021. Okay. It is described by some as suspenseful, comedy, serious and thoughtful, and by some, I mean Amazon Prime, <laughs> and <laughs> it is called The Show. The Show. Written by, not heard of it. Written by Alan Moore. I'll give you the, the, the teaser line, whatever you call it. The, a man of many talents arrives in a strange and haunted town on a mission to locate a stolen artefact for his menacing client. Fletcher finds himself entangled in a twilight world of vampires, sleeping beauties, voodoo gangsters, noir privatized, and master vengers. Welcome to the show. That sounds it, right? Yeah. Sounds and it's on Amazon Prime and Freeview. But you do get the ad, you do get a couple of adverts because I think it's like free view through Amazon Prime or whatever. Yeah, it's it written by Alan Moore. Um, yeah, have a look. Cool. I, I knew this was a film. A couple of, I wanted to talk about it so much last week, but I knew it was going to be my pick this one, so I had to hold it back. Um, yeah, it's one of those films that never heard of. We flipped through and went, "Well, that sounds all right." And then we make out watching it, and it was like. Why have I never ever heard of this before? And hopefully you will too. Cool, I'm not going to veto it. Sounds like Nick Cage should be in the lead role for it, to be fair. Um, <laughs> but yeah. cool, so that's next week. The show uh, on Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime and Freeview. Cool. And so if you want to probably find out other places. If you want to play along, then please go off and watch that and do your homework before the show next week, as we all have to. So, shutdown procedures. To commence, um, please check us out on all the different podcast streaming services. Don't forget to like, review, comment, share. We're, we're basically everywhere on um, Apple Podcasts, all the other podcast services. And to our viewers Spotify. on YouTube. Yo, um, the YouTubians. Yeah, so you can leave comments on any of those different services. Or if you want to be old-fashioned and email us, Damien, what's the email address? Podcast at mail.com and for everything else all the other content that we throw out on a weekly basis the news the reviews the little snippets of information the competitions every now and again the mothership is cultfaction.com where this week now as it's our hundredth episode we've started to give you a new treat you can tune in to which will drop probably sort of midweek every week. Our uh, cult faction news blast, where you get everything that's going down in the cult hood. The Enjoy. news blast. I like that news <laughs> blast. It's a bit different. Yeah. Let's don't get excited. It's just a roundup of. I know. The news for the week. Yeah. Yeah, and stuff that's happened. Yeah. Not to us though. We're, we're, no, no, no rambling. No comments. waffle. No waffle. <laughs> no waffle. Some would say it's the fastest few minutes in news podcasting. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> a bit like News Round with John Craven. <laughs> Little snippets. Less jumpers. <laughs> well, uh, until it's winter. For now, yeah. yeah. Cool, so I have been Paul Hawkins. I have been Brett Summers. I have been Damien Hicks and continue to be so. And thanks for listening mm -hmm. and watching if you're on YouTube. Yay. Goodbye. Bye. Stay cold. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant, that one. Can I you like do it. that so I can have that as my message? <laughs> I could make you a